A lot of times though, people, uh, once they get to know me, they're like, oh my God, you're such a fucking teddy bear. I mean, I am, I, I, I'm really nice. There is that gangster side in me, but I keep it, it's gone, it's, I keep it locked away. Like, unless you're gonna put your hands on me, there's nothing you're gonna do that's gonna get me out of character. Jordan Peterson said something, I love that guy. He said something like, to be calm, you, I must have been capable of great violence at one time. Mohawk Matt, thanks for coming through, bro. Thanks for having me. Man, how, how's it feel being in your old neighborhood? It feels, it feels cool. I mean, I, I, I love being back here whenever I can, especially Burbank, dude. Yeah, it's yeah. a trip. Yeah. Didn't you catch a case in Burbank once? Dude, <laughs> I got caught. Can I talk about it? Yeah, talk I about it. I got caught when I was, I forget, maybe 15, writing with a highlighter on the side of some building, some tire place on like Keystone and Victory. It was like my, my second arrest ever. It was so embarrassing. I mean, a highlighter. It doesn't even write on a wall. Right. Those cops are ruthless out here, boy. Yeah, Burbank PD is no joke, man. Yeah. They're, they are crazy. You, yeah. you mentioned you were riding on walls, ma'am, and you, you, you told me that you were part of uh, the tagging culture in the 90s. Tell these youngsters about how big tagging was, especially Dude. in San Fernando Valley, man. Graffiti was huge in the 90s. I mean, like, it was, it was amazing. Like, it, honestly, I don't want to glorify it, but I want to glorify it because it was like, that's, you felt alive. Like, it was like the thing to do. You know, like graffiti was something that like, it was a whole different time too, where like, it was scary, it was fun, the adrenaline, it was, uh, you had a good group of friends. I had made some of the best relationship I've ever made in the Valley uh, in graffiti in the 90s. And, uh, and uh, it, was, it, was, it was amazing. It's what, it's what the first thing I really caught on to besides sports. Right, and I remember yeah. some of the big tagging crews, MSK, AWR, STP, man. Big, huge. Huge, how many huge. members would, these, would those guys I don't, I mean, MSK and AWR were big. They were huge 101, 101 freeway bombers from here, like to ever. STP is one of the ones that I had problems with growing up, but I also made friends with recently, which I'm really proud of. Those guys are probably one of the, I have to say, the founding, like, uh, they really laid the foundation for graffiti, especially with their Valley members. They probably have a few, maybe 100 members, easy. Right. And they, they, they uh, I got to give them a lot of respect for it. And they're continuing still to this day. Right. They, they've left a legacy behind them, definitely. Right. And a lot of people, you know, think of San Fernando Valley as Studio City, Woodland Hills, yeah. Encino. Not really. There's a whole other side to the valley. We have a whole other dark tell, side. Tell yeah. them about the east side of the valley, well, I'm Matt. from the east side. I always let people know I'm from the east side of the valley, born and raised. I grew up between Mission Hills and Sun Valley. You know, we got, we got, we have our projects and ghettos too. We got Pacoima. We got San Fernando. You got some ugly parts of Silmar. Sun Valley's industrial, it's industrial and ghetto, and it's rough. It's rough and yeah, tough. And then when you get into them backsides of North Hollywood too in the projects, we got the valley, we got some, we got some dark darkness too. Yeah. yeah. SFE is is notorious. A lot of people don't know that because they didn't live through the 90s. Yep. But yeah, graffiti and these tag banging crews were huge back in the huge. day. Huge. Huge. And what happened, and and you're a testament to this, is a lot of them ended up distilling into full-blown gang gang members. Yeah. Tell us a little bit about how your tagging crew distilled into a, a, a big-time gang. So a lot of the crews, if they were big enough, they they stepped out on their own. They were given permission to become their own gangs. And like a lot of the crews, like in the Central Valley, one of my major crews was one called DYP, and we were destroying your property. And we were mostly white boys from like Granada Hills, Mission Hills, North Hills. And um, it's amazing because we were really good at what we did and we were able to, you know, it wasn't really an ethnic thing back then. It was more just like everybody in every area was graffitiing. And our crew was, was, was pretty heavy. And a lot of these other crews were more predominantly Mexican. So they were able to either establish their own gangs or ingrain into gangs. And as these nineties went on, like we had trouble with like the big dogs in jail were sending word out. We had to be hit either join a gang, you're getting killed, you know, and then uh tagging crews got more violent, started acting like gangs themselves. And my, one of my tag crews, I was from a couple WB, CFK, NHD, and those were my main graffiti crews. And I still, I'm still from there. I still, I still love the, love the graffiti scene. And I st I'm still kind of into it a little bit myself, but my one crew, DYP made the mistake. A couple of our members made a mistake and, and did something that caused all of us to have to join a gang. Right. Remember those blue binders everyone had in high school? Oh yeah. And yeah, they could slide your picture in and still graffiti on it and stuff. Right. Yeah. And, and guys would write their handle on that. And I remember a lot of LAPD would just look look for those, and that's how so, they get you. It was so easy to catch us. We had a we had a, a cop from Devonshire Division named Officer Pinner. I'll never forget. He was man. He this guy was smart. He systematically took down each of us one at a time and racked up some major bills and fines and shit for us too. 
and, and you were cooked the minute they found your handle on yeah, that. Yeah, because now we have to figure out a way. Do we change our name to a number? Do we put an asterisk behind it? Or do we alter the spelling of our name? But cops weren't dumb either. They were figuring out all of our tricks. Well, now you've graduated to a big uh, San Fernando gang that was actually under the umbrella of the Vineland Boys, which are right yep. around the corner. Yeah. And that's still a big active barrio right yeah, now. Yeah, we, we ended up uh, joining uh, Sun Valley Diablos, which back then was, yeah, we were kind of under the shadow of them at the same time, our own separate neighborhood. And they were not really that established. I would say they were still up and coming. You know, they had they had trouble with like having a green light and all that stuff because of the Vineland Boys. And that's just that's just how that went back then. And we ended up joining them. Right. And we had a bandit from Lowell Street on the show. Ooh. He they he, they were also greenlit by the big yeah. fellas. So it, it was a high pressure situation. Yeah. Now, and again, like this is all big news to a bunch of kids. They're just taggers. It's a whole other lifestyle you have to jump into real quick and get ready for. Right. Yeah. And now you're on high tactical alert, right? Yeah. Now we're all like going from carrying spray paint and markers to like 25 automatics and and 38 snub noses. And it's like a whole different culture, especially when half of our members are white. Right. And we're ingrained in this new culture. Like, and like someone like me, I, like I always tell people, I grew up with Mexicans. I'm one of the only white boys that grew up between Sun Valley, Mission Hills and San Fernando. So like I was always ingrained in that culture. It's always a, it's a part of me. Right. A lot you know of I mean? So home. I was able to bl make the blend and the transition real easy because I love them. I right. love it just like I love myself. Right. And as a, as a wood in, in prison, when yeah. you started doing your bid, did that help you a little bit, having a connection to the Latino cats? It, it did. It, it, it did. Actually, be, I was able to bring, transition all that with me, being a white boy. Still maintain who I am, but actually still staying true to the, the streets and my respect for the people I grew up with. It was actually very easy for me. Mm -hmm. and, and the people I was around, I was fortunate enough to be, when I went to prison, I, I was around some really good cats who, who really, really took me under their wing and helped me out. Right. Yeah. And there's something I respect about you, Matt, is and, and a lot of a lot of guys make the mistake of getting on these shows and blabbing about prison and the politics. Yeah. What's your stance on talking about that stuff on 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 the Internet? I feel and I say this a lot. I respect everyone's journey and their choice. I just feel that. What we've been through as prison is our business. I got a lot of brothers that I love and I could cry right now. I've had some sellies that they're never coming home, bro. They're never going to have the opportunity to get parole. I've got a lot of brothers that are there that I have to respect what they have to go through in there. So certain people, certain yards, what we do, all those secrets, sign language. I mean, a lot of stuff that we go through in there out of respect, that needs to stay in there. That's not for me to bring out to right. gather attention or gain ratings for. Right. I respect the game. Even though I'm sober and I've changed my life, I also respect enough you know, the people that choose to stay in it. I respect you. My hat is off to you. I can't do it anymore, but I'm also not going to disrespect you and, and, and share your secrets and what you go through. And, and major respect for that, yeah. because I think some things are just better left untold, right? They are. Well, be, like, I've, like I've said before, it, it, it's really nobody's business. If you want to know about prison, commit a crime and get your ass to prison. You can find out real quick. Right. I don't need to tell you what we go through because that's our business. But let's just say it's not fun. And so the it's young... It's really not, bro. And I, there were yeah. many scary nights. Right. If anyone will tell you, I don't care how tough you are, you come out here and say you weren't scared on some of those level four yards where I was at, you're fucking lying. You mentioned you you read, you know, over 6,000 books in prison, bro. That's insane. 6,612. I'm on the 13th right now. And you kept every one of those books? Yeah, I kept them all. I sent them home to my mom. That is amazing. My man. mom made sure I had plenty of reading material because I did a lot of lockdown time. And, and I, I mean, I, I'm telling you, I've read everything from like every Charles Dickens novel to every Sidney Sheldon to every... Dean Koontz and, and uh, Stephen King to everything by Sun Tzu, Frederick the Great, Nick Machiavelli. I've read all the historical books to fiction, to psychology, young. I've read it all. Yeah, you're very well read, yeah. Matt. And, it, you know, unfortunately, in our society, people tend to judge books by their cover, no pun intended. Yeah. And if I looked at you, I'd be like, man, that guy, what's his story, right? Yeah. But you have so much knowledge in psychology and biology. And, yeah. you know, you, you mentioned the big prison book is, the, you know, The Art of War. But just tactical understandings of situational awareness. Well, those books, a lot of people read them because they want to dominate. And like, but you, if, what you fail to realize is those books you read could also tell you how to run a business. The Art of War could teach you how to run a business, how to run. It's running an empire. It doesn't matter whether that's running a prison yard, an actual war in Vietnam or China, but it also can teach you how to run a business, run a family, run a home. It also right. can teach you how to deal with everyday situations. You just have to apply it in the right way and don't look at it like it's a book for power. A lot of these guys get these Robert Greene 50 strategies or the 50 cent one, or the 50 strategies, the-, the 50 the, laws of power. Yeah, yeah, the 48 laws of power, the art of seduction, they use it to manipulate women or manipulate, like you don't, no. you're gonna get out of it what you put into it. 
hundred percent. Yeah. And and so you spent a lot of time educating yourself, but you mentioned you also were were slamming dope in 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 the joint, right? Yeah, I did a little bit of that before I went to jo- the joint. Uh, back in the day, before like I, I play I play a lot of sports, played baseball. I probably was supposed to play professional baseball, and I blew it. I had one bright day at the age of twenty one. I was one of those kids that didn't smoke weed, didn't drink beer. At the bright age of twenty one, I'll never forget me and my homeboy Chubbs from from Diablos. We were sitting in a car one day in Arlita. And he had the bright idea, hey, 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 Clumsy, you want, because Clumsy was my gang name. I don't like to say that, but um, you want to try some crack? And I'm like, out of no, out of never even trying a cigarette, mind you, I'm like, sure, let's try crack cocaine. In the 90s, right after the 80s, if you knew about crack, the crack, it was like those shows you watch. Man. It was an instant addiction. Right. It ruined my life in a matter of one year straight. One year straight. One year. Everything I owned was traded, sold. I was walking around barefoot on Nordoff and Sepulveda. Uh-huh. If you know the Valley history and the legacy like I do, that Columbus to Langdon Street on Nordoff, more crack was sold there in the 90s than, yeah. than probably South Central ever. 100%. It was amazing Sepulveda back Sepulveda used to be a host stroll too. The host stroll and the crack game on Sepulveda Nordoff, boy, in the 90s was bad. It yeah. was bad, man. So bad. you started smoking crack, and then you elevated to m- meth or speed. To went- get off of crack cocaine, it was such a long, embarrassing. And when I say embarrassing, I can remember trading a Rolex for a twenty-five-dollar piece of crack oh, and being God. happy. I can remember my mom picking me up barefoot, peeing in my pants because I'm so more intent on smoking crack, and I've urinated in my own pants. And I say that because it's part of my story. That's how bad addiction can get. Yeah. It was embarrassing calling my mom to pick me up on the corner and, and she's looking at me like crying. What what the, f- like, what can I, what can we do? Nothing, nothing could change that moment. Nothing could change it until I was ready. Wow. But I had to get off of crack cocaine with methamphetamine, which was, pff, man. From the kettle to the pot. <laughs> I went pot. from smoking to slamming crystal meth. Back then, I mean, it's a huge culture shock and a jump there too in those different games. And, and that is just insane to think about that you had to use something as strong as meth to pull off the crack. And that's when the meth was real meth. Nowadays, the drugs have been so diluted with fentanyl and all these other, because you can't really get the chemicals to make them anymore. So you're doing your, these people are slamming and smoking. They, they think it's speed, but it's not really speed. Matt, Matt, why are these big, these drug dealers stepping on the dope with fentanyl when it's killing people? I don't understand that. In all that. honesty, I don't know. That's, that's scary. Me being a recovering addict myself, it's, it's scary. And I just thank God that I'm not in the drug game anymore because at any time you, you could die just with a hit. And that's, that's a scary place. Is it a struggle every day to be sober? Or is it something that you, you like if you had a glass of wine right now, would, that, would you have to drink the whole bar? Well, that's funny because I was just talking about that. I'm not an alcoholic. Okay. I'm an addict. And I think um, I always question, uh, I go through a lot during, during like the weeks. Like my, all my boys who are normies, they, like I miss being St. Patrick's Day. I want to have a shot of whiskey. I want to have some champagne on New Year's or my birthday. But my sponsor always tells me, um, you're not an alcoholic, you're an addict, but you might be able to drink like a, like a gentleman for a year, but after a year, you might end up with a needle in your arm. So I don't... It I could just, gateway you. It, and, could, yeah. it could be. So I don't take the chance. I just, I don't drink, I don't use. And every day, I want to say it's not a struggle, but at the same time, I want to say it might be. Right. Give, it, give, give, give the young guy right now who's battling addiction, what is your advice about pull, how do you just pull off? Is it something your mind just says? Pull off, like in essence, like you're done. You want to stop? Stop. How this do- is probably gonna, this is not a good thing to say, but I'm just going to be honest. There's no way to stop until you're ready. Okay. You have to be broken down, beaten down, completely exhausted. You have to be at rock bottom for you. Like, let me give you an example. My last day. Do you want to hear about my last day? Yeah. I was locked in a room in my parents' house. My parents, my house in Mission Hills was shot up by a bunch of enemies from this gang called Haskell. Haskell Locos in Van Nuys. We went at it with them and they shot my house up. So my mom moves to Santa Cruz while I'm in prison. And uh, I parole from prison with a pretty extensive habit between heroin and meth because I was, uh, and then I, again, I had PTSD from prison coming out. The world was way different after 19 years. So uh, I'm in this room and it's been a couple years off. I'm on parole still and I've had a couple violations for being dirty test. And my last day, I, 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 I can never forget. I had must have done 17 shots of meth. Oh, my God. There's ne- And I have one big vein I can always go to, but nothing's working at this point. I've got holes and blood dripping down all my arms, and I'm just exhausted. And, and I, but, but, but mind you, I've been praying for three days. I believe in Jesus and Odin at the same time, and I've been praying to both of them, make it stop, make it stop. Please, I can't handle this. I'm exhausted. I'm just like what I was sharing with you. I was at the place where I'm tired, I'm broken, I'm beaten down. And I didn't realize that, my prayers had already been answered. They're making sure that no matter how many shots I do, it's not working. 
I was just covered in blood and my mom, and I opened the door and just begged my mom to help me. You have to be at a place where you are physically and mentally broken to get sober. Nothing I can say to you, nothing your mom, your kid, there's nothing that can change it. You have to want it on your own. That's the truth. That's a true story, yeah. And that's where Sullen actually, it's funny, but by proxy, Sullen got me sober. Let's talk about Solon, man. You're a, you're a model for Solon. Yeah. Uh, and, and from what I understand, the clothing is dope because it takes a tattoo artistry yeah. and throws it on graphic tees. And, yeah. and I love that Pendleton you're wearing right there. Yeah, it's one of our classic ones. Yeah. yeah. We basically, they take our tattoo artwork from around the world, whether it's Russia, New Zealand, Latin America, it doesn't matter. We, are we have some of the greatest artists in the world when it comes to tattooing and, and artwork. And we use their artwork and put it on T-shirts and sell it. And we have a great collective group of friends around the world. Right. Yeah. And most of the face tats and, and tats, were those done in prison? Some in prison, some out here. Okay. Yeah. And tattooing's a big part of your life. Huge part of my life. Yeah. I spent so much time getting fixing all that stuff from prison. Yeah. I spent probably the past year and a half covering and fixing up a lot of that crap from prison that I've gotten. And again, it, it's not really crap, so to say, but it's just I'm at a different place where that shit's got to go. Right. You've You've elevated from I'm, that. I'm, I'm not there anymore. And I tell people that a lot, like a lot of people just want to glorify my prison. I'm like, Hey, no offense, but I don't live there anymore, man. I'm gone. Right. I'm out. I'm out. And I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna do that. And like a lot of the stuff I have on my body has had to have been removed for me to complete the changing process. Yeah, right. It's kind of a, a changing your skin almost, right? It is. It's like shedding your old skin to get new skin. And right. now I've got friends, great artists around the world that like sometimes offer to tattoo me. It's amazing. Right. And people don't realize how big the tattoo industry has become. Dude, man. it's a monster. It's a monster. We just got back from Arlington, Texas last weekend. You, you, it's, it's, a, it's a monster. The tattoo industry is huge. Right. It's huge, yeah. And Matt, a lot of people respect your story because you're very honest about your sobriety and yeah. where you've gone through. And, you know, it, the whole your whole story is really a example of a man that went through hell and back yeah. And is now dealing with PTSD. Yeah, I, I deal with that a lot, yeah. And and th there's no real cure for PTSD, is there? There's not. It's like a daily day. Because I don't take Xanax. I, I refuse any types of pills like that. So I just, I got to tough through it. Like how you deal with people. One of my biggest things is accepting that people in the world don't really have the same respect that we were forced to learn in prison. Right. You know, in prison, you, there's a few things I like to talk about that you, you can learn a lot of things when you go to prison. It's not all negative. I learned how to deal with people. You learn how to deal with people at a face-to-face -face level. We're not direct messaging. We're not messengering. We're not texting. Like, if you have a problem with someone, you will literally learn how to deal with it man-to-man. -man. And whatever the outcome is, that's the outcome. You can handle it with respect and how you carry yourself, or you can get the uh, adverse reaction. And out in the world, everyone is so used to just talking shit and disrespecting, using Messenger and Instagram and just being rude and putting your business out there. And in the real world, you can't handle it the way you would in prison. I have to bite my tongue sometimes hourly right. in the industry I work in Look, because normal people couldn't handle that. Like you're at the store and some dude bumps you. Yeah. And it's in prison. It doesn't that, say, excuse me to you. I, yeah. Yeah. That, that's, that's where I've gotten over that. My, my thing more is like when you go into these convention stuff and people, you know, like they just don't get it and they talk to you certain ways that they're just, you shouldn't be talking to anybody that way, let alone me. Correct. And I just bite my tongue and you know what? I've learned to just, I'm going to go this way. Right. You know, tell us really quick how, how big is the respect level in prison? It's huge. It's huge. Like you, like I was saying, you learn how to respect yourself. You don't even have to like those guys or that race, but you will respect them, and right. you will treat them right, or there's a serious consequence. Right. You learn how to how to network with groups as well. Right. Yeah, and that's interesting. So you got a lot of books under your belt in prison. You learned how to respect people. You learned how to navigate and deal with problems head on. So there yeah. were some positive things. That there's came a few. Out. Yeah. And, uh, and again, I learned I learned history. A lot of the times in society, we're taught history with what we're, they want us to realize. And, and if you research history, a lot of the times history is taught by the winner. It's not really taught the truthful way. You actually, if you go out and research things on your own and read books, when you find out the true historical facts in life, you're, you're actually blown away that this really isn't what it, I was taught in school. Schools will teach you based on America what we want you to learn the history was. And you go lens. to another country... That's not the truth. Right. There's a lot of stuff that I learned teaching myself, reading books and researching stuff that is amazing. Now, what, what do you think about America and the direction we're going? Uh, Are we're you concerned? In, uh, I mean, I'll say one thing. I was telling my mom this other day. I believe in God and I also believe in my Viking ancestry. But at the same time, I feel like we're at that place in the Bible where Sodom and Gomorrah 
where he rained down fire and brimstone. We're so crazy with... We're right there, aren't we? We're right there. There's a lot of weird stuff happening right now. And not to touch too much on it, but like, I'm scared for kids what they're being taught and forced to learn. It's just, we're in a scary place. We're in a very scary place, Matt. And um, are you working with youngsters? Are you trying I to try. speak? I try. I do yeah. outreach work whenever I can. I do. So, there's some outreach groups on Instagram that I'm a part of that I, that I help. Yeah. And I think that's important because there's, there's a lot of young guys that can maybe identify with your story. Yeah. They grew up in the hood and they're, yeah. they're going that wrong route. Yeah. And maybe they're starting to, you know, slam dope or whatever it is. Yeah. And uh, do you do you sponsor anybody? I do sponsor. I've got one sponsee right now, and yeah. uh, I do sponsor. I believe it or not, I use social media to help people a lot. I spend hours sometimes talking to people from here, Great Britain, on the messenger about getting through their problems. Right. Anybody in recovery can reach out to me on my on my DM. I will answer it. Yeah. I don't care. Oh, I appreciate yeah. that because we're, you know some of our audience will probably reach out to you, Matt, and yeah. get some guidance from you on how to kick meth, heroin, yeah, and get off the dope and yeah. get the clear vision. Yeah. And um, how do you sleep at night? Do you sleep better now? Or I do. I sleep better. I still have some some troubles. Uh, sometimes some of the memories of things I've been through in prison still pop up. But you have for the most part, okay. Yeah. What yeah. about microdose and mushrooms? Have you thought of that? I know I, that's a big deal with PTSD. I, I don't because I don't. Again, I'm, I'm sober, and the way me and my sponsor deal with sobriety is no mind altering substances. Whatever you got to go through, tough it out. Right. Just get through it. I don't take medications unless it's like aspirin or Sudafed or cold stuff. I don't No, Now, no offense, because I have heard that, that that helps. And, I, and a lot of my friends have actually gotten sober off meth and heroin with marijuana. I myself don't do that because I feel like that's a you're, you're getting high, like it or not. And I just uh, I know it works for a lot of people. I'm not against it. But for me and my group of sobriety people, I choose to just get through the problems. Tough it out. Yeah. Do you do AA? I do both. AA and A. I believe yeah. in both. And the 12 step is all about having a faith component, right? Yeah, having a higher power, faith and a higher power, yeah. Right. I've done my 12 steps twice, three times. I'm actually on my fourth round of 12 steps right now. That's awesome. Congratulations, Thank you. man, for, for you know, respect to the way you changed your life, man. Yeah. And, and you feel good about yourself and you feel proud about what you're doing now. Yeah, yeah I definitely yeah. do. I work really hard. Yeah. And, you know, your parents, you put them through fucking hell, man. Oh, my God. You have no idea. I put my parents, my poor parents. I'm adopted, too. And these people adopted me thinking they're getting some angel baby. Yeah. And I was adopted from, like, right out of the vagina to my mom's hands. Oh, my God. And, like, I've never questioned or wanted to disrespect them by, like, going to look for my parents or nothing. Um, but, like, for the most part, I put my parents through hell. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you, yeah. you you told me that you turned their house into like a trap house. I turned a million dollar home in San Creta into a trap house, encompassed with this whole second floor, looked like a train yard full of graffiti. I redid the stairs thinking I'm Tim the Tool Man, Tweaker Taylor. If you could see me at three in the morning, sweating, wearing boxers and a tool belt, it's ridiculous. And that's, a bandsaw going at three in the morning. My neighbors are texting like, what the fuck? And i am th- got a headlamp on. I'm doing home improvements. <laughs> it's crazy, Matt. Ridiculous. <laughs> Yeah. Man, tw- yeah, you see these tweakers now. When you see them, what, is, what goes through your mind? Are you like, holy shit? I just shit. feel horrible. Like this yeah. whole tent generation that's popping up. Um, am I allowed to say that? I mean, I don't want to be disrespectful. No. I just, I feel that as society also, we've gotten it lost between what is actual homelessness and what is we are tolerating drug use on the street corners in front of children. This whole thing that's happening, dude, I was driving here. They're living on the freeways in tents. That is insane. They're building communities with tents off of our tax dollars, giving them government money, GR, Social Security. You're buying Bluetooth speakers and you're living in tents that we're paying for and you're just doing drugs on the street. In my day, if I did slam meth in front of a kid, I would have got shot by my homeboys. Nowadays, people are doing drugs, leaving needles on the street and then blocking the walkways so children and women can't even walk down the street. And people are giving them money. Stop giving them money. Stop giving them money. Matt, if you were president of yeah. the United States, how would you solve this homeless crisis? How, I, I hate to say it, do? and this is probably going to sound insensitive, but there's only one way. You have to get rid of the problem and start over. Just go in with fucking tractors and trailers. It's got to go. Give them a chance. You got to go. We don't care where you go, but you're not living like this anymore. Maybe they have to pass. I think what happened, what I heard was they never had city ordinance wrote. They never thought they'd have to deal with people living on a freeway or living on a street. So they never had laws to enact. At the same time, I've also heard that the police have been told to stand down. Because literally, they're catching them with bags of meth. They're catching them. I was in downtown LA doing a food drive a couple weeks ago. The cops are driving by as a woman is sitting on a bus bench on 5th and Spring or St. Julian, nude, 
Let me say it again. She was naked, slamming heroin. The cops drive by, slowly watch it, and continue to drive. Dude, in my day, you're going to jail for a nickel of marijuana. Right. A nickel of marijuana would send you to jail. Right. Nowadays, they don't even care. that, like, our, they, they just don't care, and it's insane. This is happening in front of children. Walking home from school, they have to walk through tents. It's disrespectful to all the people that are better than me that pay taxes and own homes in these neighborhoods. I'm sorry. You, you mentioned bulldozing the whole thing. You just got to bulldoze it or light but, it on fire and tell them this is they, trash. Where do these guys go now, Matt? I, honestly, I don't care. Figure it out. I had to figure it out. Yeah. They built, like in North Hollywood, off the 170, there's a homeless community they built for them. On our tax dollars, mind you, they built them little huts with Bluetooth TVs, air conditioning units, and a bed. They won't go because now they have rules. They can't get high. They can't drink, and they have to, they have to like, be in by a curfew. God forbid, if you're homeless, if I was homeless, I would jump at that opportunity. They don't want to go to these places that are built because they have structure and they can't do drugs, which simply proves the fact that they're not homeless. These are, this is drug addiction rampant all over our streets. Right. You know, maybe we open up some mental institutions, bro. Yeah, didn't I mean, we close a few of them? I think we might need to. And then again, I'm hearing that the cops don't want to arrest them for drugs because they don't want them in the jail. Well, darn, you have to do your job, officer. Yeah. I mean... They're caught with drugs. I mean, isn't that a crime? What right. are you showing kids? Right. It's an open jail is what it is. Downtown yeah, I, is just an open jail, you know? Yeah, I guess we, that's true. They know where they're at. They know where they know where they're at. So they don't have to arrest them. It's, but it's right. But it's, it's just it's destroyed and decayed society. Yeah, man. look at how gross LA is turning. I'm from LA. I love LA. Yeah. I tell people all the time, I fucking love LA. I love the Valley, but this is turning it into a gross, like trash area. Man, all the RVs on San Fernando. Did have you see, you seen? Oh my God, have you been on the 101? Yes. Coming from LA, if you catch the 101 right by Universal Studios, there's like 42 RVs with their trash hanging off the sides. Dude, go through with a flamethrower, I say. That's retarded, dude. Yeah. To all those people that live in the hills right there, why are they not complaining about that? That's their front yard. That's It's crazy, it's bro. Disres- and they're just doing drugs. Yeah, they're just slamming dope. They're and- slamming. That behavior is methamphetamine. That's meth behavior. Is that right meth there. behavior? The, the collection of trash, the accumulation of all the excess. The hoarding. Crap, the hoarding. That's methamphetamine. I did it. Right. I did it myself. I'm no different. I'm no better. But it's right. got to stop. The, the, you're allowing it to run rampant on our streets. Yeah. No, it, it's, yeah. It's, it's become a problem, man. You know, uh, Solon Clothing has you going all over the states, and you're going yeah. international too, right? Yeah, we are. Where are you guys headed? Well, okay, so next month we have uh, Golden State, Pasadena, then we have Vegas. Um, I think there's talks in the work. We have Pennsylvania after that, and then there is talks about, we had talked about the Dominican Republic and maybe Puerto Rico, and then maybe I heard they do France and Romania once a year too. Man, that's going to be I just finally put in for my passport. This is big for me. I've never had a passport. I'm waiting on it right now. You think you'll get it? Well, yeah, they said with my crime, as long as you're not rape, arson, or murder, I don't have none of those, you should get your passport. What was your crime, Matt? We have... I had, I had a few. I had a fel- two counts of felony vandalism, two counts of criminal threats. I had a kidnapping, which was dropped to a... I didn't know this, but if you push somebody, that's technically kidnapping. Right. They can arrest you for it. It didn't hold up in court, but I was arrested for it. Um, I had a assault, felony assault, home invasion. Um, I've had a couple shopliftings, um, some graf- a lot of vandalism as a kid, yeah. a lot of graffiti. How, how do you break the stereotype when people see you in the store and they, you could tell they go, whoa, they're taken back by your look. Do you, do you kind of kill them with a little kindness? Or? I try. A, lo- yeah. a lot of times, though, people, uh, once they get to know me, they're like, oh, my God, you're such a fucking teddy bear. I mean, I am. I, I, I'm really nice. There is that gangster side in me, but I keep it. It's gone. It's, I keep it locked away. Yeah. Like, unless you're going to put your hands on me, there's nothing you're going to do that's going to get me out of character. Right. And inside us all are two dogs. One is a vicious, mean fucking dog, and the other is just a beautiful, benevolent dog. Well, I think uh, Jordan Peterson said something. I love that guy. He said something like, to be, to be, to be calm, you, I must have been capable of great violence at one time. You know, the things that jam up men are women you don't know that well and women you know too well. Hmm. How has it been for you having relationships with women coming out of prison, going through the life you've lived, how do you dumb down yourself to, to uh, be with a woman, basically? Well, one of the things, my, one of my best friends is Uncle Jeremy, the owner of Sullen. I'm with him every day. He's, he's a great example for me. He's like a mentor, and he's a great example of someone who has a marriage and, and works through it and has a good life and a good business, and he has a group of us that he takes with him everywhere and under his wing like family and friends, and he always tells me, you're, you're playing catch-up. 
you spent so much time. He goes, just be patient. Because I, I find myself sometimes rushing into relationships because I am playing catch up. I lost so much time. I lost the whole dating phase that people go through in their 20s. I didn't learn how to be patient and pick and choose. I do find myself um, maybe meeting a girl or dating like six of them at once. And then I pick the one usually ends up the wrong one out of a group. I don't know why my pickers broke like that, but I usually will rush into it. And then before I know it, I'm in a relationship. And then the woman has now, when girls meet me, they, they tend to want that gangster on my look. Like you said, looks can be deceiving. They want that guy now. And then when they get to know me, I'm soft, I'm generous, I'm romantic. I read books. I'm not out there fist fighting at the bar to protect your image. Like I'm, I'm kind of more calm. But when they meet me, they're expecting this aggressive, big old fucking wolf that's gonna just like manhandle them. And and I think that uh, that's not what they get because that's not me anymore. It's still there, but I'm not me anymore. So I find myself in the wrong relationships a lot because of uh, what I've gone through and how I I do want to have a family and settle down. Right, you know? right, and that's that's a beautiful thing. You know, you mentioned you, you, you're you a lightning rod for picking the wrong woman. Lightning rod. Do you think that's subconscious that you do that? Or I, guess, it- I guess because I've always like, I, I, I tell this story a lot. In prison, I was always the number two guy. I never wanted to be the number one. Number one guy gets snitched on or he gets killed. The number two guy stays and transfers power. I'm always steady out there. So number two is good for me. And I tend to pick, I'll date some girls. And for some reason, I was always the one who helped all my homeboys. My house was always the house where all the kids hung out at. So I'm always the guy that wants to help the homeboys. They were they didn't have shirts. Well, my mom bought me four. Let me give you two of my shirts. So when it comes to women, I do the same thing. I'll have a group of good ones, and God forbid I choose the one that's independent and successful and stands on her own feet and doesn't need me to buy her dinner. I always gravitate more towards the one that's like the Cinderella. Help me, or what? Not the Cinderella, but what's the it's the broken the, the broken, broken the broken w- princess? Bird. I need the yeah, broken bird, the right. broken princess. Yeah. Let me help you and take the care wounded of you. bird. Yeah, yeah, like recently, before you know it, I'm thirty five hundred dollars in debt. I've paid your car payment, your rent, and then you're tired of me and you disappear on me. Right. And I'm like, wow, we had a lot of great sex and bought some stuff. We traveled. Now you're gone. Right. Now three months of investment is gone. Now I got to start over right. embarrassed. <laughs> you want the wounded bird, huh? Yeah. I don't really want that, but necessarily my brain gravitates towards that. Man, I could relate. Yeah. Yeah. It's it's just the way it is. Yeah. Now, would you ever date a woman who's going through sobriety or is that a no-go? I mean, I will, but I tend to not. Recovery is such a big part of my life that I try to get out of it as much as possible. I don't want to have a life or a relationship encompassed sucked into the recovery process. Right. I prefer to date a, norm, a normie. A normie. I don't mind a woman that drinks or occasionally smokes pot. Now, past that, I won't fuck with them. Right. You don't nope. want her doing it, some party bumps in if the you house. Do, and, even if you do yeah. party bumps, I got to go. I'm not I'm not tolerating that. I'm not taking that chance. Yeah. If you want to smoke some pot, I've never smoked pot, so it's not a trigger for me. If you want to occasionally drink, I'm cool with that. Yeah. yeah. Now, I, you, you know, we, we saw you, some of our producers saw you in not only a YG video, but a, a yeah. video with Kaneo. Yeah. And um, Conejo's great, dude. He's a great dude, great. man. Shout out to Conejo. Yeah. He was great in this last movie with David Ayers. Yes. Uh, called Tax Collector, bro. Yeah. He stole dude, it. That's That movie is phenomenal. phenomenal. I mean, they, they actually give the game out. That's like a realistic portrayal. And he was funny because he told me they cut out about another hour of that movie because the movie was too long for budget. There's a whole other hour of wow. details when it comes to Creeper and stuff that, that should be seen. I it's like, a phenomenal movie. I like all of his work. Did you ever see Harsh Times? Yes, I saw Harsh Times. Yeah. I love Everything that they do is great, dude. Yeah, he's um, great. He's really captured LA, David Ayers. He, and Conejo's so intelligent. He's another example of, yeah, a gang member turned his life around, went through hell, came back. He's super intelligent. Yeah. Reads as well. No, he's well yeah. read, man. Yeah. And 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 now is acting on the horizon for you? I know you have your SAG card, right? No, I don't. I'm you like don't? one okay. I have one signature, I need two more. Let's get you that going, yeah. Matt. If we could help you. Yeah, we'd we've love got it. a lot Thank of you. connects there. Yeah. Um, so let's get that rolling because I could see you being a a lead in a romantic comedy. <laughs> yeah, I could be a notebook part too, huh? <laughs> you picture me in that? <laughs> the hood version. The hood right, version. The, right? yeah. the hood version. <laughs> yeah. Um, I would love to do that. That's what I've been trying to do. I've been doing little videos here and there, YG video. I've done a few videos, you yeah. know, but Conejo is the first one that gave me actual my face shot in the whole drug dealing scene. Right. It's awesome. Right. No, yeah. that's cool, man. And and we have a casting agent that kind of handles kind of your look, you know what oh, I mean? Cool. So we'll plug you in with him. Thank you so much. Big Mike, yeah. man. Yeah. So, no, that's awesome, man. I'm, I'm proud of you, Matt, because you come out of the valley, man. You're a wood. It's, there's a, you know, a lot of people don't realize what a burden it is to be a, a white inmate. Yeah. You know, and we've had a few of those on the show. Yeah. And, 
And the first thing that happens when you show up to county is what size shoes are those, homie? Yeah, we made sure that that doesn't happen no more, though. Right. Yeah, but, th- but you're right. That's part of our history. We had to deal with that a lot. W- white boys walking around black eyes in county jail. And, you know what I mean? Then eventually we, we made sure that's, that's not happening no more. Right. And there's, there's something that I want to get out of the way. You know, a lot of people see the tattoos, the bald head. Yeah. They see that you're a wood. But every interaction we've had, there's not one racist bone in your body. No. You've got black homeboys. You've got Latino homeboys, yeah. Asians. Speak on that a little bit about the misstereotype people might have of you, Matt. Yeah, a lot of people do. They want to stereotype me as that, and it's not really. If you know my history and you want to take five minutes to listen to me, I grew up with Mexicans. My, I went to St. Ferdinand's Elementary in San Fernando. I was one of four white boys in an all-Mexican private school. That was difficult. That had me not wanting to be white. That had me wanting brown eyes when I was a kid. I thought I was different. And, uh, you know, if you've grown up in the Valley, like like we did, I mean, I'm born and raised SFV. I love the Valley. The Valley is my life. It is it is not tattooed on my forehead by accident. You know, like the Valley to me is like there's, I made all, I always tell people I made my bones here, I broke my bones here, and then I rebuilt them here. Mm. I love this Valley. But, but, but there's no way to have grown up interculturally I didn't grow up understanding what racism was at all. Like I said, I grew up between two cities that are predominantly white and Mexican, Mission Hills and Sun Valley. It's a mixture of both. So I'm yeah. uh, one of my best friends today is a rapper, Bad Wolf. He's black. He's fucking, I love this dude. My other, one of my other best friends, you see me in numerous videos with his Asian. Like people think that I'm one way, but then when you get, if you listen to me, you'll, you'll realize that. Right. And, and when you're out in public, can people come up and approach you? Are you yeah. cool with that? You know? Yeah. Obviously totally cool with, with good that. intentions. Yeah, yeah, totally. Yeah. Yeah. And um, where can we see, do you have your own Facebook IG page? I have a Facebook. I believe it's the same as my Instagram. They're connected. Mohawk Matt underscore SFV. Okay. We'll definitely throw that in the link, Matt. And um, man, thank you so much for coming through, bro. You're welcome, bro. Thank we, you for having me. We appreciate it. And yeah. uh, we'll be looking for you, bro. Thank you, bro. Thank you so much.